My name is Chris Oputa. I started business quite early. Um, I remember I was 11 when I decided to open my first venture. I'd always th I've always thought about business. I've always thought about what, seen things, seen the opportunities where a lot of people haven't seen them. And um, I'm going to have to tell you a few minutes of this because I'm going to go through what I call the five tsunamis, okay? My, my five tsunamis and how they will help people living in today's Nigeria. Okay, we lived as children in America, came back, and um, when we got back here, one of the things I found out was in my church in the States, we all were desperate to go to church because at Sunday school, they gave us donuts. So those donuts, that was the church, donuts. So I came back and I was living in the Badon, and at, after church, in Sunday school, they give us chin chin. And I said, hey, I am not excited by the chin chin. I could, make, don't, I could bring donuts from home or cake from home. I started to bake every Saturday night, all night, with my, with my parents' house help, and bring cake to church. And it exploded, right? It exploded. That continued um, at the time, in the Nigeria of that time, um, parents who were earning a salary could take their children on holiday internationally with a salary. So let's say in today's Nigeria, you'd call that a wealthy family, but we were a middle class family who was a professor. Now, I found out when I would travel, they would give all of us 350 pounds each of the children, because we, we travel for two months, a month. And all my siblings were busy buying things for themselves. I found out that in the UK and Europe, they had sales. And during these sales, you find things that I knew were selling back home for a fortune, for pennies. So I used all my money, bought things for sale. Came back, found buyers, especially on campus in UI, I think I was 13 years old at the time. There was a guy in a boutique, female fashion, because my mom had a small fashion house at, which was at, at home. So I knew about female fashion. I read Vogue magazine, Cosmopolitan. I knew, I knew about female fashion. So I'd buy, I'd buy this and sell to the guy. And they'd buy everything I bought and pay me half the money on delivery. And the balance of the money, say two weeks later, so I did a deal with my mom. I grew tall pretty quickly. So at 13, I was this, this height at 13. So I could board a plane almost like, I mean, a, a, t a teenager, pro proper teenager. So I, I would travel weekends, Friday through Sunday, buy stuff, come back and sell, buy stuff, come back and sell, and built up what I'd call a fortune from this, what I would, at the time. Now, this is where it gets interesting. By the time I got into university, I got into university at 15, I had all this money in my account at something, it's called IBWA. It became AfriBank later. I had about 20,000 Naira back then, which was 20,000 pounds. 20,000 pounds at the time, because I know when we go to the bank to buy BTA, I get 993 naira or so per, something, that, some 900, 9.93, whatever. So this 20,000 pounds was my trading money. I had, I was able to travel, to trade. And then one bright day in 1983, the black market was one to two. 1.5 to 1.5 naira to 1 naira, black market. The government of the day, on radio, announced a 500 percent devaluation of the money. So my 20,000 pound, 20,000 naira, which was 20,000 pounds, became like 4,000 pounds. So, and everybody, this is across board, across every every Nigerian who is above, in my age range, I won't tell you my age right now, 
500% lost. So, like I said, hey, what am I going to do? Because something interesting happened. With my cycle of trading, the guys who I was buying from, because what, what I started, at first I was buying on sale, and then I found out a deeper way. Get to the shops, when they finish their sales, the entire sales stock is taken away by one or two companies. And those companies now take them to the markets, the Liverpool streets and everything. So I had a deal with the guys who took the sales stock. And after about 10 purchases, they now gave me credit. So at 14, 15, if I pay them 3,000 pounds, I get 6,000 pounds of goods. The government had devalued the currency by 500%. I had from 20,000 and 4,000, and I owed the guys abroad money. So I was stranded. What could I do? How could I recover? Then something interesting happened, and it's going it's to link to everything I will tell you till, till this very day. Whenever I would go to buy the, um, the clothes, the guys, the office was in a place called Hatton Gardens. And in Hatton Gardens, I noticed that there were jewelers, people selling, uh, we, they have notices, we buy gold, we buy this, we buy that. And so I said to myself, that's true. The economy has crashed. What are women doing back home? All the women back home were trying to sell their jewelry. Everyone was trying to sell their jewelry because they couldn't survive, they couldn't survive this crash. So I told everyone that could, there was nothing like internet or um, WhatsApp groups. I passed the word around everyone on campus, first of all, and everyone who wanted to know that I was buying gold. The guys in Hatton Gardens, I bought a testing kit, so I knew 9 carat, 12 carat, 18 carat, etc. I started to buy people's gold at my own, at a rate that was better than the guys in the market. But that rate was giving me Naira to sterling at one to one. So my 20,000 Naira, which was supposed to be 20,000 pounds, which had been crushed, I was able through this way to achieve the same level and pay off my debts internationally and continue to trade even when everyone else was in trouble. It took a full year and a half before the, the thing stabilized in the country and then people started to find out this game that one could, one could apply. So I found that I was able to, to, to excel when everyone else was struggling. Go forward, going forward, it happened again. I built up my money. By, t by the time I was leaving university, I found I had about three or 400,000 Naira in my accounts in leaving university. And then again, a second tsunami, Babangida now did another 500% devaluation. I was like, I almost went crazy. That come, what is going on? How is it possible that I build up this, I do all this work, do everything I could do, find out that I'm at a stable point, and the government of the day makes me poorer. The government, as far as I was concerned, the government is stealing my money. So how can I do this? And the government just steals my money. And so I was, I was pretty much stranded again. And I said to myself, you know what? This thing is giving me mental stress. At that young age, oh, what can I do to protect my money from these, from these government folks who just don't care? And I said, I'll do what my mom did. Because my mom, throughout school, she was, she had businesses, small businesses. Poultry, this, that, this, that. I said, let me open a small business that will generate, I don't care how much it makes, but it, let it be that I'm spending from what the business makes, not from the main capital of my business, and not from, let me start to spend, let me start to earn from a small business. I don't have to work there. It, hasn't, it doesn't have to be a business of passion, just a business, just a cash cow that protects my mind. Because I realized that throughout the time these things were happening, 
people around us, families around us, there was, I mean, wholesale depression on a national level. Because fam salaries were not increased, so people were stranded. People were taking their kids out of school, and this continued to happen to, in our country. So in opening that business, I found that, hey, as this business is selling, making money, because I never wanted to work. I, I'm, a, I'm a chemical engineer, but I knew I would never work for anyone. So I, and I, that caused a lot of problem, problems in my home, my, 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 my parents, etc. But as soon as I opened that business, and I was still chasing other contracts, etc. But as soon as I opened that business, I got my mind clear. I had something to look fall back on. I had something that was going on every day, whether or not I was there. And I found that to be a panacea, something that would help any person who wants to start off in life, whether you're working in a job or not. I found that creating something, whatever, however small it is, it's not about the amount of money you make. It's the fact that you have something that is coming in every day. It's giving you some kind of mental relief, which helps you to plan to the next level. So that happened, and it, as it was going on, I was still doing other contracting, etc. And then I opened more. I said, you know what? I also learned about something which is important for me to tell you, because we're talking about thriving in chaos. You see, there's something in our company, we call it the only child syndrome. And it's particular to Africa and Nigeria. I realized that for some reason, when I spoke to, my, my mom is an only child. In speaking to my grand, late grandmom, she told me that, she, I, I was wondering why there were so many kids in the house, so many, she was always raising dozens of children. And she said, look, in this our country, there are forces that we don't see. If I have only one child, I have to, and I can't have children, other children, I must adopt and surround that my child with other children and love them like my child. Because that way, the forces that are looking for how to take my child will be confused by the fact that my love is spread. I took that with me and I said, you know what? I started to look at things. Every time I heard about a loss, one child was killed. Oh, the only child of this family was lost. Oh, the only child of that family was lost. The only child, the only child, the only child. I took it into my business and said, hey, if I have only one business, only one, com only one outlet, when I had that outlet, today there's a, there's a fire, tomorrow there's this, tomorrow, I said, you know what? Let me scale this business. Not because of the reasons people think, but because that business is like an only child. That business is like an only child. And there's something about our country which you have to, I'm gonna go a bit deep, so the adults, the children amongst us might, under, might not understand yet, but I'm gonna go a bit deep, okay? You see, we are spirit beings. We are spirit beings first. Beyond the, and business, life, everything revolves around the spirit. It's not about Christianity or Islam. It's about the spirit. And when there's a congregation of negative spirits, a congregation of anger, of hatred, of jealousy, of envy, of all these negative things, when they congregate in the space, that space becomes a very dangerous space for anybody. Now, we tend to think that um, we look at Europe, America, and other countries of the world and say, oh, in those places, their spirits are so loving and caring, and it's right. And you find that there's less of the issues that we deal with here in present day Europe and America. But the three things I want you guys to do is you must be, if you're going to go into business, you become a student of history, a student of enterprise, and a student of war. I'm a student of these three things. And then being a student of enterprise, war, and, inter and um, history, I went, I went looking, I said, is it that, what, why, why is it that Europe, America, and all these places, why is it that they have such love 
they show to themselves, they show to the poor, they show, why is that love there? What makes them, because if it's Christianity, they, they found, yes, they were, they were in Christianity before us, if it's, but even though they were in Christianity before us, we've been in Christianity for almost 200 years, a lot of places. So what is making it so? And in checking through history, I found something very disturbing. In the 15th century to the, to the 18th century, in Europe, there, was, there were laws against witchcraft. There were laws and there were panels set up against witchcraft. And these panels set up a committee, co committees across Germany, Europe, England, across Europe. The committees started to do what you call witch hunting today. They had committees that went city to city. They tested people's spirits. If they found you to be a person that lays curses on people, that's a sorcerer, that is involved in rituals, ritual killings, involved in any of those things, you were taken and burned to the stake in your, this Europe. So for two, 250 to 300 years in a stretch, it was in the parliament, it was in government, witchcraft was fully tackled headlong. And over 250,000 people were burned to the stake in that UK you're looking at. You can Google, when you have time, read it up. So over the decades, people were forced to mind their language. People were forced to stop cursing other people's lives. People were forced by threat of death to become people of love. It wasn't through convincing them through prayers. No, they were forced in Europe and America to denounce witchcraft by, by, in, in order to save their own lives. And this force is what made them over the decades to have a culture of love through force. Bring it back to our country. We have a culture of witchcraft in our country. And most of just brooms and all, no, that's not, that's immaterial. A culture of evil and hatred pervading the country where we are here, whether we like it or not, when we hear about 400 people killed in a, con in a corner, and we have our, we're going to ask what's for lunch. We're numb to the suffering and to the things that are happening amongst our people. Therefore, in our country, the, 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 our, our enemy, our common enemy, is running, riding roughshod over everything we do. And for that reason, when you have that level of negativity of spirit in the air, it puts people who are in poverty, who, it, it just binds them. So you find that so many people cannot see the opportunities around them because they are bound spiritually by these forces. Those forces are, it's, it's not about, if you look and say PDP, ABC, forget that. That's not the, the, the critical thing is there's a lack of love at play. And that lack of love hurts everything. Businesses you want to do, anything you want to do, if you don't know these are hurt by the lack of love. Now, how do you overcome, how do you thrive in an environment that is spiritually charged negatively? You can still thrive in an environment that has this level of hatred, of blood sacrifice every single day. We all hear about it. You hear that they found one headless body. Don't think that the headless body, the person was, became headless by himself or herself. There is blood sacrifice every single day in the hundreds and the thousands in this country. So how do you, as a business person, how do you as a mother, how do you as a, as a parent protect yourself, protect your business, and thrive in an environment that is laden with witchcraft and hatred and forces that we cannot see? I learned how to do it. I learned, I learned the hard way. How did I find out? And how, and how will this lesson help you? I, was, I got married. I got married in 2020, 2022. My ex-wife and I had some issues in, 2020, in 20, 2005. And when we were having these issues, 
nothing in my business moved. Everything was crashing in my business. My parents did not have, there was no love lost between my parents and my ex-wife. My family, everyone was against this woman, but I said, hey, I'm going for this. So when, when things were going downhill, it was easy for everyone to label my ex-wife as the reason for my business not thriving, that I, I, I married a bad wife. That was the narrative. And so in the middle of this heat, when everything was going crazy, I went to seek for deliverance in church, to talk to someone in, in my church. And he said to me, I said, he said, what do I think is the problem? I said, well, since I married this woman, you know, I, he said, am I trying to imply that they, he said, no, 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 no. That, you see, a lot of men make a mistake of believing when they have an issue at home that it has to be the wife. He said, if you have, are not, have not forgiven her for whatever she's done, and you're not loving your wife, there's no love in that home, nothing can work for you. Nothing will work in that home, that it's a law. And so I said, okay, if that's the case, and I'm, and I, and I'm really, really upset with what she did, and I haven't found it in my spirit to forgive her, what do I do? He said, well, you have only two options. Either you find a way, despite everything, to love this woman, or you get a divorce and you live quietly. But you cannot live in the middle of that because the, amount of, the forces that are around in this country are, are looking for people who, are, who are have a divided home. And they will, come in, they will come in at force for you. And they came in at force for my business. And anybody who tried to help me that time was also affected. I could not get help. Eventually, I said, you know what? I'm, I had to walk. And I did leave my marriage. I, I walked from a marriage. And I told, I went, when, I, when I got to um, ask God for forgiveness and for his support, the next thing he said to me, well, the, the, um, the prayer session we had is that I should choose, in this 30-day fast we're going to do, choose a ministry and tie God's return to your business with that ministry. And I said, I don't know what you mean by ministry. He said, because I thought, I mean, what's a ministry? He said, it could be any ministry. It could be the blind, it could be the deaf, it could be the widows, but choose a ministry in your spirit. Surrender that ministry to God and tie your success. Tell God that if he comes back to you and prospers you, you're not going to use the prosperity to show off with jets or things like this. You're going to really support that ministry. And it's not going to be on TV and in papers or for public consumption. It's between you and your creator. I made that vow that day to God and the miracles unfolded galore and they haven't stopped happening. I wish I had more time. There's a lot I could share, but I assure you, whatever you're doing as business people, tie it not for yourself. Tie it to a ministry. Support that ministry because that's what God will use to bulletproof you from the forces in our country. In Europe is different. They've, they've dealt with their issues. Nigeria hasn't dealt with their issues yet. And those issues are, must be dealt with. It's not about Christianity or Islam. It's about love. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. About a round of applause for Mr. Fine. Oh, Buta. Uh,